This week on Wealth Track, setting your investment course for the next four years. What does the Obama win mean for the economy, your taxes, and your portfolio? A Wealth Track exclusive with longtime number one ranked Washington analyst Tom Gallagher is next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack. I want to tell you about a new opportunity to watch Consuelo Mack Wealth Track before the program appears on public television. As a subscriber, you can see programs 48 hours in advance of the general public and also find timely interviews and commentaries exclusive to WealthTrack premium subscribers. I'm going to sit down with investment legend John Bogle, the founder of mutual fund giant Vanguard and creator of index funds, will share his investment lessons of a lifetime. If you're interested, just go to WealthTrack.com for more information. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. The waiting is over. The decisions have been made. President Obama has four more years. The Senate remains with a Democratic majority. And the House of Representatives is firmly controlled by Republicans. What is being called a status quo government has a big job ahead of it. To right a struggling economy and get America back on the growth track. The economy was the number one issue in the exit polls. Well, no one said it would be easy. Wall Street's initial reaction to the election was negative. The Dow suffered its biggest decline in a year, off more than 300 points, or 2.4 percent, on Wednesday. But the 12 months leading up to the election has been an impressive one, with stocks up across the board. Even before the president and Congress begin their new term in January, he and the lame duck legislators have critical work to do. The dreaded and much heralded fiscal cliff looms large as much as $700 billion in across-the-board spending cuts and tax raises are set to automatically take effect the 1st of January unless Congress and the White House take action to avert it. If they don't, the economy could be thrown into recession. Another major and related challenge, the federal debt limit, or ceiling as it is called. Currently set at $16.4 trillion, it is expected to be hit sometime before year end. If it's not raised or the deficit reduced, the government won't be able to pay its bills and risks defaulting on its debt. Well, this week, Fitch Ratings Agency warned the economic policy challenge facing the president is to put in place a credible deficit reduction plan necessary to underpin economic recovery and confidence in the full faith and credit of the U.S. If it doesn't, Fitch said it will downgrade its AAA credit rating of U.S. Treasury securities, Another ratings agency, Moody's, has threatened to do the same, and Standard & Poor's did so in August of last year. What is the likelihood of a credible deficit reduction plan happening? What will the election mean for the economy, markets, and your portfolio? Well, this week's guest is noted Washington analyst Tom Gallagher, who is ranked number one in his field by Institutional Investor Magazine for 10 years in a row. Before becoming a principal at the Scowcroft Group last year, where he advises clients on U.S. monetary, fiscal, and political matters, Tom was the head of ISI Group's policy research team in Washington. I began the interview by asking Tom Gallagher about the prospects for the fiscal cliff being avoided between now and the December 31st deadline. I think it's more likely than not that the lame duck session will come up with a, a compromise that averts the worst of the fiscal cliff. Um, that is, uh, some of the elements of the fiscal cliff will likely take place. Um, the payroll tax cut will probably expire. But I, I think unemployment that benefits extension that's, won't that's be probably that kind of stuff. That, that, exactly, that, that okay. sort of thing. But that um, most of everything else, it, it's not that I think there'll be a, a deal on the underlying issues. There won't, won't be a grand bargain on the deficit involving entitlement cuts and tax increases. But instead, it'll be what uh, Speaker Boehner talked about a bridge to move these issues into next year, to let the winners of the election decide these big questions. Um, and they'll probably have some kind of a process set up to try to facilitate an agreement on these, uh, on these issues next year. So, I, I, and I think the motive for doing that is that none of the leaders want 
to um, want a recession next year. I mean, that's what will happen if, right. they, if, they, if they don't do that. The fiscal cliff, by some estimates, is almost 5% of GDP. Yes, right. The economy's only growing at 2%. So that's a formula for a recession, according to just about any, any uh, forecaster. So I think it's the desire to avoid blame for the recession, not a mandate from voters to compromise that leads to that outcome. Now, having said that, you know, what's that, a two and three probability, you know, a one in three chance that we, that we go over the cliff. The last uh, experience we have at this kind of negotiation was the super committee process, which did end in failure. So that's a good basis for pessimism about this. But I think the right. difference is that the consequences of failure of the super committee process were automatic spending cuts that were to take place 15 months later. Yeah, that seems like an eternity to them, a right. Exactly. I think that um, this is more like the debt limit negotiations in June and July of 2011, where the consequences of failing to raise the debt limit were immediate and drastic. Uh, had they not raised the debt limit, they would have had to start cutting spending by 40% across the board, which is 8% like of GDP. So it, this is more like that set of negotiations where the consequences are serious and immediate. Right. So I think that provides the incentive to get an agreement, really to kick the issues over to next year and to set up a process to facilitate more orderly deficit reduction. Okay, so let's talk about the debt ceiling. And according to the Treasury, you know, that it's going to, we're going to hit that $16.4 trillion debt ceiling limit sometime this year. So what's the outlook for that? That's when the debt ceiling is formally hit, but then there are some standard accounting maneuvers. Right, that the Treasury that, can do, right? That the Treasury will do that will get them into February or March. So most private estimates are that the effective deadline is sometime toward the end of the first quarter next year. So that's one of the issues that's all connected in this fiscal cliff uh, set of negotiations that will that, will, that are about to, to take place. Um, I, I know the the House Republicans, Speaker Boehner, this uh, week said he didn't want the debt limit to be part of these talks, but the White House really wants it, um, and and so I, I think that th that will be part of you know the Bush tax cuts, the automatic spending cuts. Um, uh, all these issues will be resolved in, in, in one, well, you know, will be resolved in one set of negotiations. <laughs> right, and resolved, you know, can, can, can be a, exactly. a, a, a many, many outcomes. A resolution can be kicking the can, yeah. So, so just talk to me about the dynamics of this. We have a status quo government, so the guys that are in office now are going to be in office again in January. So, so yeah. I mean, has anything changed to so the gridlock that the markets are afraid of, that business leaders are afraid of? Is it is there any reason for that to change next year? Small reason to expect. I mean, it is odd uh, that you had the lowest approval rating for Congress ever, and so what did voters do but return each party to the majority in, in the House and the Senate? Right. Um, and, and so there isn't much of a message to change. Uh, I'd say the message from voters is kind of an awkward one. The message is to get things done without compromising on, on the priorities of your party's base, which is a very difficult thing to do. That's why I, I, my expectation on the fiscal cliff isn't really based on the perception that the winners have a mandate to compromise. It's right. more that they have a desire to avoid blame and that that will lead to the kind of a compromise that, that moves issues off into next year, um, but, but it doesn't really create the conditions for a major deal, you know, a grand bargain next year on entitlement reform and tax increases. I think that's probably, uh, th that's an unlikely scenario. So therefore, from our point of view as citizens, <laughs> you know, as far as the economy is concerned and as far as, you know, our desire for jo more jobs, um, for our desire not to have, you know, taxes raised in a very dramatic fashion, uh, so, so what's the outlook for us then, you know, next year after the inauguration? Yeah, I, I think in some way, you know, the fiscal cliff is a great metaphor because you got so many things happening and the economy does risk going off a uh, cliff at the end right. of the year. But, Sequestration, I mean, uh, I mean, you name it, it's right. a nightmare but, for but, the economy. Right, but in some ways it, it, it sets up a false image of what the stakes are in, in this. It's not just this dichotomy where we either, you know, it's not a binary situation where either we go over the cliff or we avoid it. Um, we're entering a period where fiscal policy, you know, spending and tax policy is likely to be a headwind for, you know, several years because right. it, it, it is a priority. Voters have sent that message that they want the deficit to come down. The problem with the fiscal cliff is that it's too much too soon. Yes. You know, it's it's 5% of GDP when the economy's not growing very fast. So the idea is to try to smooth it out. 
there will still be some headwind from fiscal policy next year. Instead of 5%, it'll be maybe 1, 1.5% one of GDP. So perversely, voters may want growth, but the policies that are likely to come out of the fiscal policy debate are going to be a headwind on the economy. Right. And I think that's, it gets back to the, uh, it's, it's an inherent part of economies that have been through a financial crisis. That initially you get government support to prevent a severe recession from becoming a depression, but then at some point voters, more than markets, voters demand the deficits be shrunk and that that uh, is what uh, what creates the headwind for the economy. So, so the, the markets, in fact, uh, you know, on occasion are demanding that the deficits be shrunk too. Because when they, you know, when, when they think, for instance, that gridlock's going to continue, the markets are not necessarily positive, right? Or, I, or, or what, what do you think? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm I looking, would, what are the dynamics, the political dynamics that you think we should be watching uh, well, that will affect the markets? Right. From the market point of view, I think the market is much, much more nervous about too much deficit reduction next year than they are about too little deficit okay. reduction over the next, uh, over the next several years. Um, it, it, you, just, you look at how the market would reflect concerns about long-term deficits. You could see high long-term interest rates. You could see credit default swaps on U.S. Treasuries being high. You know other ways that you might detect that. And there's just no evidence that markets are nervous about that. However, they are nervous about too much deficit reduction next year. I think that's a good candidate to explain why markets fell so much the day after the election. It's a status quo election. You get that out of the way. The next thing the markets to focus on is the fiscal cliff. And so they, they get nervous about a recession next year. So right. I, I think that that it doesn't mean that politicians should ignore long-term deficits. I'm not arguing that at all. I think that ideally uh, the politicians would have backloaded deficit reduction. That allows the economy to get through this deleveraging process further before the the deficit reduction kicks in. The problem is that sounds like it lacks credibility. So politicians don't like to do that. But if you're in favor of front-loaded deficit reduction, you should let the economy go over the fiscal cliff because that's that's pretty material deficit reduction up front. And, and so anyway, I, I think the markets don't uh, are, are more worried about uh, the you know too much deficit reduction next year. Let's talk about what we do know that certain Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, it's mm. it is law. It's going to happen, right? And so, you know, that's something that's that's going to have an, an impact, certainly on the healthcare sector. Um, it's going to have an immediate impact on upper income Americans because there's going to be this 3.8 percent investment uh, tax on investments. So, t t tell me about what the, you know that kind of that new reality. What we should be paying attention to as far as the impact of of the Obamacare Affordable Care Act. Yes. I, I just, you know, we know the policy. We know right. the law. The law is in place. There's no uncertainty about that. With this election outcome, not just Obama being reelected, but the Senate remaining Democratic, in fact, more Democratic than, uh, than the last Congress, um, it, it just tells you that, that, uh, that health care reform is going to be implemented. Right. Uh, and so the, it's really the uncertainty about the rollback that is now lifted. And I, I think that's a, a broader that invites a broader perspective on the significance of the second term for Obama. I think it's really to that, that his second term will be about protecting the accomplishments of the first term. You okay. go back to the first two years, Obama was, you know, he had a very rare situation in American politics where you had the, the White House and 60 percent of the how nearly 60 percent of the House and 60 percent of the Senate right. controlled by the, the same Democratic party. Democratic lock, right. Did. And so you got not just the stimulus bill, but you had the health care reform, you had financial um, services, re-regulation. Um, Dodd-Frank. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so I, I think this is more about preserving those legislative accomplishments rather than seeking new ones, like uh, climate change. That's an issue that a lot of liberals would like the next uh, uh, Obama or the next Obama term to address. I think the prospect for that is remote. In other words, I don't think it's about expanding the agenda. I think it's more about consolidating uh, the agenda that Obama had in the first term. And healthcare is a good example of that. And the healthcare stocks, you know, have uh, you know they've had a pretty decent performance here, which right. is not a big surprise because you're expanding coverage. So it does suggest more. Uh, you know, revenues flowing into the flowing into that sector. So what we've seen, you know, in, in the first week after the election, what we've seen is is that you know the financial stocks got hit really hard. So Dodd Frank's here to stay. Regulations aren't going to be rolled back. In other words, at least for the next two years until who knows what's going to happen in the midterm election next time around. Um, and and we, we certainly have. So, so we, we've got the Affordable Care Act. So, so so the winners and losers that the market has clearly delineated already. Bank stocks have gone down. 
um, some hospital stocks have gone up. I, I can't remember, you know, what else in the the medical yeah. sphere. So, yeah, so insurance are, stocks have done well. Insurance stocks, sort of right? Yeah. So, 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 you know, is, is are there any other, you know, less clear winners and losers, or you know, is is there something that you would say, you know, you should definitely, you know, go with the trend? This is a long term trend. Not, not really. I, I okay. think that that these sector implications were well telegraphed, you know, well analyzed in advance, and in a normal election year there might have been some momentum for some of those plays, you know, maybe being nervous about coal uh, under a reelected Obama, that sort of thing. But I think the fiscal cliff just truncates all of that, uh, that, you know, the markets are always ready for the next big thing, and now the next big thing is right upon us. So I think that the way Washington's going to affect the markets for the next couple of months will be uh, through the fiscal cliff implications. Defense stocks uh, are one clear bellwether for the outlook for the fiscal cliff. I think dividend paying stocks, you know, that... And right, the, defense is already being cut. It's going to be cut more. Right. But Div- if, if the outlook is poor for a compromise, then defense stocks get hit worse. Mm-hmm. And I, I think defense stocks are probably priced for a, a resolution. So there's that there's that risk. All right. Um, and I think dividend paying stocks would be another one because uh, only because, under Because gridlock, tax rates on dividends are, will the, This year they're 15%. Up. Next year... They go to forty four point six percent. Even under capital gain. Capital gains are only going to about twenty three point eight, uh, uh, maybe twenty five. <laughs> depends on what elements you're including in that. So that dividend stocks could be another one if you think that if the market thinks that Washington's going to have a protracted gridlock on this, that you go through the end of the year and well into next year, then those are the kind of sectors that are going to sell off. So I, I think that's the focus on Washington right now. I think it's fiscal cliff plays, not Obama re-election plays that are the thing that will be driving the markets. So, so Tom, so what do I do? <laughs> I mean, do I get more defensive now because of the, the still the uncertainty and we don't know what's going to happen? It depends on your time frame. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, my time frame is longer than most of the right. stuff. All right. So, so, uh, so, well, so ours is on wealth track too, but if you're sure looking we care at what's going to happen year, tomorrow. Try not to read the papers for uh-huh. the next couple of months <laughs> um, because I would not try to time the fiscal cliff. Um, I mean, you know, one thought I've had is if you have some cash and you see dividend uh, or say equity income funds sell off a lot because of the fears of a protracted gridlock and high tax rate, then I'd be uh, inclined to, to be a buyer of those just because I don't think that you'll get protracted stalemate. You know, right. if we don't get it at the end of this year, a deal at the end of this year, I think it'll be one quickly in the, the beginning of next year. And I don't. Th- I think the only way you get really high dividend taxes is, is under this protracted gridlock scenario, uh, kind of an overlooked development when the Senate Democrats came up with their tax bill that was their basis for the election year debate. Republicans had theirs, Democrats had theirs. Democrats lined up with Obama on every issue except the top tax rate on dividends. Obama was going to let it go back to 44.6. Democrats said, no, let's keep it at, at 20%. So I think that tells you that just about any compromise that comes out of Congress is going to keep dividend taxes uh, they'll, they'll go up a little, and they'll pro- but they'll probably stay on par with uh, with capital gains. So, um, but but for the most part, I, I think other than something like that, I would just try to look past all this, and say that uh, that fiscal policy is not likely to cause a recession. It is a reason not to expect robust growth. The U.S. you know is growing at about two percent. There are signs that you know, with housing turning around, um, that maybe it, it it could rise a little bit above that. But I think fiscal policy is a reason not to expect it to get much stronger than that. So. I, I, I would try to look past that and say we're still in a deleveraging environment, but the U.S. has had a better policy response than the rest of the world. So I actually feel fairly good about the prospects for U.S. equities relative to um, you know, other other major equity markets. Well, the other thing that's going on too is is you you are a South Dakota na- native, <laughs> but but your your sis, brother or sister state, North Dakota, is having this incredible boom in natural gas production. And that's another area that, that you think could, could be a real big positive for the U.S. and for the economy and business, right? Right. I mean, when you, when you look at the problems that the major economic centers have, uh, you know, the U.S. has fiscal policy. Europe has everything. You know, it's sovereign crisis, sovereign debt crisis and its banking problems. Uh, China is trying to cope with uh, the massive property bubble that right. came in the response to the to the financial crisis here. I, I think the U.S. problems are relatively better. I, I like the line that Mohammed El Aryan uh, at, at PIMCO. PIMCO used about U.S. Treasuries uh, a few years ago. They were the least dirty shirt in the laundry. I feel like that's the way of, with U.S. equities. 
and, and so the, the energy story is part of that longer term. You know, I think we've had a better policy response than other countries have. Uh, we have a better energy situation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's having largely, you know, for economic forces, market forces, not so much government policy. And, and you think it's still positive even though the, the president until, you know, recently was, was not, was, you know, focusing on alternatives and really, you know, didn't vote for the, you know, didn't approve the Keystone Pipeline. So, but you think it's not going to change that that's still a very positive outlook I think under most, this president? Most of these trends are more bottom up. If you're waiting right. for policy or if you, I, I think it's a mistake to overweight policy too much in these kind of things. So I think that's still, that's another advantage that the U.S. has. I think demographics are another advantage. Uh, so I, I think just uh, the influx of immigrants. I mean, right, you, oh, exactly, you look, you, right. You, you look at other, you know, Japan, China, right. you know, the demographics suggest that we are going to age less fast than most of the rest of the, the developed world. So, I mean, all of those to me say that over a somewhat longer time period, the U.S. still is, is good. I, I think the deleveraging process still limits how fast growth can be, but I like our situation better. No, so you do have this issue. Can politicians avoid having a self-inflicted wound? Uh, and that's what we're all looking for. For in ter in, uh, looking for evidence for that in terms of how the two sides are going to behave in this post-election period. Um, and, and so provided that we get through the fiscal cliff, then I do feel better about uh, prospects for U.S. equities. Another certainty uh, is, is Ben Bernanke is here at least until the end of his, of his uh, 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 what is it, uh, the his, end of 2013. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't know whether he's going to go or stay, but we do know that, that the Obama administration is more dovish. They, they like the easing. They like what the Fed's doing. So the Fed policy is going to stay the same for the foreseeable future, correct? Yes, yes. I mean, there was that risk that if Romney won, that right. he would replace, he said he would replace Bernanke. And, and I think, frankly, a lot of Fed watchers have thought, you know, for some time that Bernanke is unlikely to seek a third term. Uh, if... Um, he were open to it. There's still the issue of whether he could get through, uh, you know, the over uh, a Senate filibuster. So I think there's still an expectation that that Obama will replace someone, or appoint someone to replace him at the end of January 2014 when his term expires. But that it will be someone who will uh, uh, reflect continuity in policy. Right. So, so I, I, th I think that's really not. Uh, uh, an issue, you know, that you can expect the elements of Fed policy, which got very aggressive in their September meeting uh, in terms of the rate guidance and the open-ended QE, that that's going to play out as expected uh, without kind of interruptions from the, the right. political So arena. keep buying treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, and interest rates, short-term interest rates are going to end long-term, are probably going to stay pretty low. Well, I'm, I'm not a believer that I think the, the majority view is that the Fed is kind of significantly um, holding up uh, asset prices above their fair value with what they're doing. I, I'm, I'm more of a believer that the markets, that, that you have those temporary effects, but that say the stock market I think is really following the economy mm -hmm. uh, more than it is, uh, you know, Fed policy. I think Fed policy is, is a good insurance against a big downturn, but I, I, I think its impact is relatively limited in a deleveraging environment. So I, I'm, I wouldn't want to base my investment philosophies on the effectiveness of quantitative easing. You know, a lot of people thought that, you, therefore, you should be long equities when the Fed launched their open-ended QE. But initially, after that meeting, the economic data were still weak, and so the markets were, were weak until the data turned around. So I, I would follow the data, not the Fed, okay. uh, in terms of uh, investments. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, and, and I will preface this by saying that I, you told me a long time ago that you know don't buy or sell stocks depending upon who the occupant is in the White House. So, so what's your one investment? My one stock for the future really reflects what we were just talking about. I, I think in the past, when I've been on your show, I've talked a lot about income-oriented strategies. Uh, MLPs, uh, tax exempt right. bonds. Uh, but now? Um, now, but I think, though, I still believe that, but I think those are pretty fully priced. So I just think from a medium to long term perspective, um, the SP 100 is a, is a good place to be. The uh, OEF is the ticker for, for the, the ETF, uh, for, the iShares. For the, mm -hmm. the iShares ETF. And I, I just think that reflects this. You know, notion that we had a better policy response to the financial crisis. We've got advantages in terms of demographics and energy, but you want big cap countries, uh, companies with solid balance sheets, which is why I tilt a little more toward the S and P one hundred. All right, S and P one hundred. So, Tom yes. Gallagher. We'll see what happens. Thank you so much for joining us on Wealth Track. Thanks for having me.
At the conclusion of every Wealth Track, we give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is stay with your chosen stock positions. As Tom Gallagher just told us, the occupant of the White House should not determine whether you buy or sell stocks. What should help you make that decision are all the tried and true considerations, such as your personal financial objectives, tolerance for risk, investment time horizon, and the level of stock prices. Now, if history is any guide, next year should be positive for stocks. According to Strategus Research Partners, the last three times a Democrat won the White House for a second term, the S&P 500 gained an average annual return of 21.5% in the first year. Let's hope history repeats itself. Well, next week, we're going to have a big treat for you. I'm going to sit down with investment legend John Bogle, the founder of mutual fund giant Vanguard and creator of index funds, will share his investment lessons of a lifetime, a not-to-be-missed interview. And if you'd like to see this program again, please visit our website, WealthTrack.com. Premium subscribers can see WealthTrack 48 hours in advance, and additional interviews with our guests are available in our WealthTrack Extra feature. And that concludes this edition of WealthTrack. Thank you for watching, and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. And Wintergreen, your home for global value.